fine. This is fine. It's fine. This is fine. If only the listener, Dan, could see this room, see that you and I should be at equal eye length, but we're, I'm feeling slightly lower than you because I'm downhill from you yeah. in this room. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? It's just a gravitational anomaly. It's just, a gra- it's just, you know, we're in flux, folks. That's all. What's the coolest space thing to you? The coolest space thing? Yeah. It's, it's got to be black holes, right? Things in space. <laughs> Yeah, black holes cool. The the asteroids. I feel like they're overdoing about. it a bit, you know. I don't know. They're pretty unexplainably like what does come out the other <laughs> side of a black hole. Yeah, that's fair enough. Mm. Are they just wormholes? I'm asking you, like, wormholes. Like, our resident I don't know. What's a black hole? I don't what is know. a black hole? I've, like, there's a lot of like speculative uh. science, obviously, <laughs> as you would imagine. I don't know. Huh. I don't know whether I think bl- black holes. I remember coming across some kind of like speculative astrophysics that that has some logic behind it, I suppose, that was speculating that like behind black holes there is there are other dimensions minus one. There are other Whoa. Fuck, there are other universes minus one dimension. So like something about two dimensional uni- the universes with two dimensions rather than three. Okay. I don't know. I'd be cool with that. Also, there might be like whole, there might be whole new <sighs> universes, because there's nothing. Oh. To, I mean, there's nothing to <laughs> distinct. Like, like, what is there to distinguish between like a black hole and the singularity that existed before the expansion of the universe that was is commonly referred to as the Big Bang? I don't I'm, know. Should we, uh, you're freaking me out. <laughs> you're freaking me out. What is the difference? I don't no, know. I don't know. But what is the difference between the singularity? In the black hole, yeah. the wise man asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is not. I mean, we don't have a field of expertise, but I think this is definitely not it. So, I maybe I, we should move on. I I will say before we move on, I am one of those people that gets freaked out by the Hubble deep space mm. uh, photograph. That yeah. is just like, come on, yeah. What's the point? I always experience a very acute existential dread when I get to the like. I'm going out and I'm going out and out and out and out and out away from Earth. Yeah. And it's usually when I get to the edge of the universe. Obviously, <laughs> I mean that that is quite a logical place yeah, to, experience to experience the most dread. severe existential dread. <laughs> but I mean, one might experience it by the very vast size of the sol, even of the solar sure, system, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Try to fathom how big the sun is, kind of thing. And yeah. they reckon that the, realize that the sun is like moderately sized <laughs> relative to like uh, some stars. Yeah. I got a very, I remember once when I was a kid. But what is outside of the universe? Exactly. When I was a kid, I tried to ask like a know it all astronomy guy. Like, yeah. he was like, So the universe is constantly expanding. And I was like, Well, it's on the other side of that. And he was like, like, you know, some snotty kids. Like, I've had so millions of people have asked me this before. And I asked him, and he was just like, Well, you can't answer that. And I was like, mm. <laughs> I was like, But what is on the other side? Mm. Nothing, mm. everything, a black hole. Well, the, I guess the expansion is relative to the stuff inside it, right? Like, does it, does it need something to expand into, or is it just like a. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> Personally, if you're asking me, I do sure not know. <laughs> I have no idea. I'll say yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose expansion is a in, is a feature internal to our experience and understanding of the soul of the universe, rather. Mm. Uh, what is the expansion anyway? Yeah. <laughs> I, I barely passed geometry. Or you what, <laughs> things like expanding into nothing. I don't know about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my thought, my thought on this, my enjoyment of that field of science stems purely from it representing to me a collection of. Very peculiar and interesting stories. Sure, yeah. Um, and I have no bearing... The the mathematics behind it, I have no comprehension mm. of. Yeah. That's the same with me, I think, for history. because it's mm. And especially why I really like ancient history, because it's just like, this could all be bullshit, but it's the story that we have. So enjoy it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why not? What else yeah, are you going to yeah, believe? Yeah. Something else? There's uh, some famous historian... Uh, one of the first lines of his book is something like, because it's all about Rome or something like that. He's like, um, ancient history is like, might be a lie, but you got to believe it. <laughs> it's like, all right. Okay. What else are you going to do? Exactly. Like, like what else are you going to do? Yeah. Study the ar- archaeology. Get out of Ugh. here. Get out of here. It's all ideology, Dan. Yeah. History is ideologically driven, yeah. as we all know. Oh, let's not call it ideology. Let's call it wild speculation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm fine with that. And uh, yeah, 
Yeah. I like speculation. Yeah. And I like appeals to the wild. Mm. Yeah. Being wild. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, speaking of wild speculation, um, today the speculation is, has ended. Specu- <laughs> we're continuing with the speculation. Oh, okay. We're uh, today's trade deadline day in the MLB, just to date when we're recording this. Um, and there have been some pretty big blockbuster trades for the Dodgers. Oh, the only oh, I know most people won't care about this, so all I'm going to say is that the biggest trade for Scherzer and Trey Turner is uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited, and I want to get that recorded so that in a week, when it inevitably comes out, that deal <laughs> fell apart, I can go back and be like, oh, Jack, uh, <laughs> you had you had hope. Um, or when hope. both of those players like are a total flop at the Dodgers. Exactly. Like, what a moron Jack was. What an yeah. idiot. I don't know anything about baseball. Do you know anything about Max Scherzer? No, no. He has two different colored eyes. He's one of the, like a husky. Uh, He's got a red, not yeah. a red eye, a, <laughs> a blue eye and a brown eye. What's that called? Hey. Uh it has a name. He does have a name. It's got a name. Yeah. yeah. He's cool. I'll say that. I thought you were going to tell me that speculation has ended over um, what the Cincinnati baseball team were going to call themselves. Oh, yes, Dan. <laughs> it has. This is, <laughs> come next Friday, going to be extremely late news. <laughs> but for everyone that's been holding on with bated breath and only getting their baseball news from us <laughs> on this Marxist podcast. That's me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Um, the Cincinnati, not Cincinnati, Cleveland, Cleveland, oh, sorry, Cleveland baseball team who, uh, previously called the Indians gross, um, have a name and it is not the Cleveland Hunt together. (laughs) The Cleveland primitive accumulators. Um, it is the Cleveland guardians and, uh, uh, not sponsored by the newspaper. It is, there are two. If you live in Cleveland, famous statues, not, not throwing shade to like our Cleveland people, but like nobody outside of your city really knows about these statues. I think like those cool. big statues that they go past in Lord of the Rings that are like the two blokes. Dan, the... you read my mind what I was about to say. They're oh, exactly sorry. like the Argonath. <laughs> exactly like that. There's two statues on either side of this bridge, and it's just two fellas. It's like an art deco thing from like, I guess when the government used to do art or whatever. And they're cool statues. They're mm. really, really cool. But that's well, they're what not like a thousand there. feet tall. They're, yeah, exactly. They're not Lord of the Rings esque. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so there you go, the Guardians. Mm. And I was a little like, that's eh, kind of a lame name. Um, but then I started going through other baseball t- teams' names. And I was the like, Nationals. The Nationals. Yeah. The team from Philadelphia is just called the Phillies. It's like, all right, they all kind of suck. So Guardians is better than that. So yeah. yeah. Kudos. Yeah. There you go. Cleveland. Cleveland. I've got that right. The Cleveland Guardians. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. It's a name. Fair enough. Yeah. I Better mean, than it was. I know. So. <laughs> Anticlimactic, given all of the uh, <laughs> the uh, speculation and the, yeah. the, the the period of time mm. that they have been without a name. Yeah. yeah. They perhaps could have done better. Could have done better. Um, but at the same time, I think if you're in Cleveland, people are like, nice. All right. The Guardians. We <laughs> yeah, love the Guardians. We know what this means. <laughs> yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Cleveland Guardians, folks. Okay. okay. We did it. Mm. Um, any other news? Anything else to go over? I don't know. I was wondering whether I might ask you. You might mm. be a, a bit. You might be a bit young for this. Whether <laughs> you had any particular engagement with emo at any point in your life? I did not. No, no. that's a hard no for yeah. me. I remember. Neither did I. I. Sorry, my. I just this week I just sort of like <laughs> was kind of regretting never having okay. been an emo. I I've suppose. never heard anyone use yeah. that sentence before. <laughs> but interesting. I don't know where it came from, really. Huh. I suppose maybe I was I was speculating <laughs> on my musical history, my uh, history of listening to music, and basically I, I came across a video that was about My Chemical Romance. Okay, sure. And I was just a bit like, I have some association understanding uh, of the band My Chemical Romance, <laughs> but like, I was a bit like, did my life lack for never having had an emo phase what yeah. it was it that kept i think maybe it was the kind of like what was it that kept me from that right yeah, yeah did yeah. i have a degree of like snobbery did i do my in-group <laughs> out-group teenager thing in the wrong way could i have been more enlightened i mean yeah. no, nobody too enlightened no, to nobody has ever nobody has ever speculated upon their life and wish they'd been more enlightened as a teenager and the result of that <laughs> is they wish they'd listen to My Chemical Romance, but that was almost the thought process that I had this week. <laughs> God, I wish. I wish that was me. I'd like to know so what you I've were. I've had a peculiar week. Maybe it was just because I was regretting not having the right kind of uh, nostalgic resonances mm. when mm. it came to that band or that genre or... Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I was definitely amongst the people like 
throwing plastic bottles at my chemical romance rather nice. than like nice. And I mean, I think that I went to specific. I went to download music festival one year. I think two thousand seven. Right. I think they played that year in two thousand seven. You threw a bottle at well, them. Well, no, but that was what happened, and I yeah okay. maybe I was like tacitly supportive. <laughs> I was yeah, I, I wasn't active in, in enough in any way as a teenager to be involved in that, but I might have yeah. been like you might have been pass- passively. Um, you were closer to that than supportive. speaking emo. Yeah, 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 and I regret it now. Well, I think my closest. It's funny you say that because my closest brush with being emo was remember when iTunes used to do like free song of the week downloads. Do you remember that? No. One of them was the song, the My Chemical Romance song. Um, Black parade. Black parade. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And my brother and I got that, and we're like, all right, uh-huh. that was it. Then I moved on. Uh-huh. I liked ACDC. I tried to listening to that cool. album this week. Oh, okay. And that song is the only one that stands out as being. <laughs> Maybe it's because it's the only one that I know. Uh, but I was like, none of these songs. This doesn't feel like a very good like piece. The con- <laughs> the concept didn't shine through very strongly for me. It was not an artistic vision. <laughs> well, like, I oh, don't know. I don't cringe. know. Maybe I just don't get it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah, I sure. just don't understand my chemical. Romance. Now I see why you actually want to be emo to understand my chemical romance. I suppose yeah. so. Hmm. I suppose so. To get it. You still I can. So. But I do. I, I I like that song. Yeah. It's a song. song. Yeah, that's a song. I haven't listened to it in years. I was years. also, I, I did, you know, you know, a few weeks ago, and I was like, I saw a guy with a, a Slipknot t-shirt, and now oh, I, yeah. I, I felt like I had to go and listen to Slipknot. Well, yeah. I saw a guy in the high street with a Ghost t-shirt on. You know, <laughs> oh yeah, Ghost? sure, Ghost. Yeah, yeah. And there's one song of theirs that I really quite like, and so mm. I've watched, it, I've listened to that several times mm. this week. But I can't find any more of their music that uh, I can yeah, yeah. enjoy in the same way. Ghost so. is one of those bands that they always tour with bands that I like, and then I'm always like, eh, I just yeah, yeah. Ghost. I don't know, Ghost. So, listeners, let me know what's the best <laughs> Ghost album. <laughs> Yeah. The best ghost album. Yeah. Given that I like the song Square Hammer, right. what's the best ghost album? Hmm. Hmm. Um, Dan. Did you see the, um, hmm. uh, rest in peace, Joey Jordison. Oh, so I was about to say, yeah. yeah. Very yeah, sad, yeah. very sad. Yeah, very sad. A lot of people were like, not like, obviously Slipknot fans were upset, uh-huh. and like ex-Slipknot fans were upset, but also like musicians. Like a lot of musicians were like, damn, this dude could play. Mm-hmm. I haven't thought about Slipknot in a very long time, but I was just like, <laughs> "What's my problem?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dan's always bringing Slipknot no, no, up. No, no. Um, but yeah, bummer. Yeah, it was yeah. funny. I saw the article on BBC, and it was like, um, uh, "What's his name?" Jordison. Joey Jordison. Yeah, yeah. they're like, uh, "Mr. Jordison, uh, pictured bottom right with the white mask." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, which of the yeah. masked men? Like, right. right. <laughs> <film, most laughs> so the is. one that we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Shame. Yeah. Did you know the current? This is, this is just a factoid now. <laughs> the current um, Slipknot drummer, I think his name is Jay, um, <laughs> Jay. Weinberg, something Jay, like that. Okay. He's the son of a guy called Max Weinberg, who's the drummer from the E Street Band. Really? Yeah, Bruce Springsteen's E wow, Street that's Band. Insane. And also, he has filled in for his dad previously. Whoa, so the current sick. Slipknot drummer has also drummed with... He used, to, he used to drum for the band Against Me, but he also oh, wow. has drummed for the band... The East Street, East Street Band, Band with Bruce Springsteen. They're playing like Atlantic City and he's like double kick. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He brings his double bass pedal out. Like. <laughs> well, that's funny. Yeah, Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. I have a huge... I mean, I like... I don't listen to a lot of metal anymore, but I do mm. have a real place in my heart for like double bass pedal. Oh, the it's double kick is like, like so get good. out of here. And, so uh, good. and anybody who can play mm. drums like that, I'm, mm. I'm in awe of. Far king- more than any instrument probably. But maybe it's yeah. because like... I just don't understand how guitar or other instruments work, but like <laughs> I can pretend to be able to do yeah, percussion yeah. type yeah, stuff. Yeah, sure, yeah, but yeah. like from where I am to like that, mm. it's just like yeah. that's like that's like I don't know. That I mean like that's it's bl- like black hole shit. <laughs> that's what that is. Dude, the uh check out the King Gizzard most recent KXP session where they play songs from their thrash album and it's just like whoa. Uh-huh. The main drummer is just like on another level with the <laughs> with the double kick it's just like get out of here so good apparently they announced they're gonna do a doom album which i'm like come on that's like, <laughs> that's put it so out on cool. my birthday that's like gonna be me come on um so yeah it's gonna be dope especially after the most recent album which is just like pop it's like wow I'm like, yeah, come yeah, on yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway uh-huh. take the piss take it, yeah, yeah a bit yeah. um yeah. okay all right i think we've covered it, think we've covered it. <laughs> <laughs> slipknot check my Gamble Romance, check. Um, mm. E Street Band, check. Um, 
I think it's very funny that one last thing that the guitar player, whatever his name is from the E Street Band, is like in The Sopranos and is like an actor. Oh, it's very funny. I didn't know that. Very clearly has a toupee and all this stuff. And like when he's in the <laughs> when band, he's on he has stage. A, okay. He has just like the headband and it's like his thing. Oh, he always wears a headband, but it's like, dude, you're bald. Come on, we all know it. Yeah. What are you going to do? Sad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sad, folks. Very sad. <laughs> Speaking of. Um, Sad times. Sad times? Speaking of good times, yeah. Dan. Um, the reading this week, I've really liked everything that we've read recently. Kind of makes sense, obviously, because it's like we pick things that we like. This is, I haven't felt like this kind of like excited and like about new ideas about a reading, obviously with the fundamental principles stuff. But this was like, I don't know. I got re- I really, really liked this. And it was really refreshing, I think. Um, hit us with it, Dan. Uh-huh. What was it? Um, eagle-eared <laughs> listeners may well remember back in episode 10 mm. when we were t- when I was talking about things that I might like to read in the future one of the books oh. that I proposed was uh, Marcel Solons' Stone Age Economics there you go. Um, when I recently acquired a copy and discovered that it wasn't a whole book but in fact a series of essays we I was love like... that <laughs> we love it when they do that uh, so I'll give you the restatement score um <laughs> Although they are they are essays that are conjoined in a way that function as a narrative of a book, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like, great, well, we can read an essay from Stone Age Economics. Yes. So the essay that we read was the first essay that appears in that book. It's called mm. The Original Affluent Society. One thing, I, one, what year was this from? Because actually I didn't look. 60 Oh, okay, something. wow. All right. Because, yeah, a lot of the references that he makes to anthropology are like very early. And for some reason I was just assuming that this was a relatively recent book. Um 72. The book first came out in 72. Mm. Oh, yeah. When that essay was written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think 68. 68. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, this rocked, and it is pretty much exactly the title of the book. It's trying to have a bit of anthropological economy, I guess. Yeah, you're really cool. One of, his stated aim is that he's trying to found a discipline of anthropological economics, I suppose. Or yeah. A, uh, yeah, and so I mean it's cool because it's like we talk a lot about modes of production. We talk a lot about like you know the ones that are the vague ones. It's like the primitive one, the ancient one, the feudal one, the capitalist one, the socialist one, which are kind of unhelpful in a lot of them in their own ways. Um, especially you know something like feudalism, just saying feudalism or whatever. But man, the primitive mode. If we want to talk about like the most stable mode. And, like, potentially the one that was, okay, I'm going back to being a primitivist, but it was 10 episodes ago. But, like, man, they, there's a reason he calls it the original affluent society, because basically he's making the point here, I guess, right? That, like, a lot of what we think of hunter-gatherers to be like uh, is not true. And, in fact, they had it maybe a lot better than even farmers, which is, like, yeah, I'm all in on. I'm all in on this hunter-gatherer stuff. Yeah, he starts the essay, doesn't he, by talking about the sort of common sense, both in the st- field of anthropology, but also in the field of like mainstream economics, mm. the common sense understanding of what, um, I don't know what we're calling it, I suppose, hunter-gatherer society, Mm-mm. pre-agricultural society was like. And there is a great resonance here between the critique he's making and the critique of the commercialization model of the transition to capitalism that we were introduced to when we read Ellen Mixon's Wood, The Origins of Capitalism. For sure. In that sense, I mean, they both, they both, um, Adam Smith also gets a reference in this book as he does in Ellen Mixon's Wood's book, obviously. Mm. Um, the sort of economic and the, the, the anthropological argument that he's trying to fight against is the one which says that basically capitalism is the ultimate affirmation of human beings innate behavior i suppose Mm. and um all of history has just been the sort of unfolding of human potential leading to the ultimate affirmation of human society which is market capitalism i suppose (laughs) Um, it sounds so funny to say it out like that it's like what um and I suppose as regards the the sort of, let's call it primitive communist mode of production, mm. um, the sort of like conventional anthropological view would have been, here are human beings toiling day in, day out to eke out a <laughs> meager existence, 
sort of like in a desperate search for food that's forever vanishing and hard to come by. Um, and given the amount of work that they do trying to eke out a meager existence by facilitating their subsistence, I suppose, mm. um, they have little time for leisure or culture. One of the quotes from an anthropologist that he quotes basically is the gist of which is human beings such live at this period of time were living such a desperate existence that they were little different from animals themselves kind yeah. of thing. So at um, at the whim of nature mm. and so um, sort of crushed by the, the grinding necessity of... Uh... Having to get food, yeah. <laughs> having to hunt, having to gather. <laughs> It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because you saying that made me just realize that there's such a contradiction between the, like, ideology of, like, the new world, let's just say, in the Americas, where it's counterposing these, like, poor natives who had to scratch and get everything that they needed. They had all sucked and they were, you know, like, had to hunt and people were just dying because they were always dying of famine, which Marshall Holmes obviously comes out of saying fake news. That's not true. Mm -hmm. But that there's such a contradiction between that and the, like, propaganda of, like... Well, I suppose it's not propaganda. It's kind of just true. The like rich new world and the like you can't you can see buffalo from space, baby, you know, and like, you know, you reach into the rivers and you just pick out fish. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Which one is it? Is it because like you can see the buffalo from space and you can just reach into a river and pick out fish. But it's like you're telling me these people it's like that almost just implies that it's like, well, you know, the natives were just too stupid to figure it out. We had to come <laughs> and figure it out. And like, you know, that gets us to like the lock that we talked about a bit in um the Alamecans would as being like, we had to come along and give what they had market value, baby. And it's just like, it's a complete contradiction. It makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, one of the, basically just to reiterate that one of the mm -hmm. astonishments that anthropologists had with it all, one of the things that was noted about this mode of production was that these people seem to live far below mm -hmm. the means of that would provide, that would, it would be possible for them to live at kind of thing, I suppose, or if they made f fully utilized the, um, environment that they lived in and all the things that all the ways in which they could benefit from it kind of thing well and you yeah i mean you also like so, so, solon salens solens he's like trying to give maybe some of the anthropologists like at least a bit of a benefit of the doubt and not just have them come across as like racist pricks right because it's like a lot of the anthropological like studies that we get came well after colonization and so you know one of the main points in this essay is like they talk you read some like asshole Australian, like, talking about the Aborigines. And it's, he's like, these people do actually, like, live a meager existence in some parts of, like, in and around our, like, cities, you know what I mean? And it's like, well, yeah, because you came and you completely disrupted their way of life. You completely disrupted their food sources. You kind of ruined everything. And now they're in this limbo where they're not adapted to living, like, this agricultural life or even, like, you know, industrial life. And, yeah, he's, everything's screwed up. So his point basically is just, like, you know, a lot of these anthropologists uh, are doing bad science, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's, it's worth saying as a general disclaimer, I suppose, as Solon's would and does, that one, he's, the evidence that he's providing for his arguments is basically ethnographic and anthropological research done between like the mid-19th and the mid-20th century for the most part. There are some mm, earlier yeah. studies stated kind of thing. Um, so a lot of it is built on observations of groups that have already encountered sort of western colonizers i suppose or and who are living in certain proximity mm. um and there's a bit toward the end of the essay where he almost speculates that a great a huge amount of like what might be the sort of like cultural heights and wealth of this society is just obscured to us because of what colonialism has done to these places before we've even had opportunity to like yeah. study them i suppose kind yeah. Of thing. yeah 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 um mm. like them even the, the most affluent the people the, the the groups of hunter gatherers or what have you that were living in the most uh, in the areas most heavily endowed with rich resources are also the ones that were first colonized by people kind yeah. of thing so like yeah the, yeah the people living the most affluent life in these societies are also the ones that were er eradicated the first kind of thing yeah uh, even though that even that said, the ones he does have ev evidence for seems to heavily contradict this idea that they were living 
Great lives of toil, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, no, 100%. And it's funny because, like, you get this this ideology, obviously, in school of, like, history really only started uh, with the Neolithic Revolution, right? And, you know, it's like, it, before that, we were living this hard, toiled existence, scratching by from meal to meal. Um, we'll get in, I think, to the Neolithic Revolution and our problems with that uh, here in a sec. But it's also, it's worth, I guess, just maybe talking about how Solon's predicts a lot of these people just lived, right? Because if you go to, like, Alaska, still parts where there just, like, aren't a lot of people, you can just see, like, the river is, like, you literally cannot see the bottom because there are just so many fish there. And these are, like, fish that, you know, you go to, like, Whole Foods or whatever and pay however much you pay for fish. I don't know. Um, and so, I, like, his point is that maybe one example that is kind of useful is he talks about kind of like white Westerners coming across like uh, what he calls like Bushmen or something like that, like nomads living in like a desert style uh, environment. And uh, the story that comes down is like the Bushmen really helped uh, these white guys and the white guys wanted to like give them something like a compass or something like that. And all of the nomads were like, why would we want more stuff? Like that completely like is contraposed to like our entire way of life. Like don't give us more stuff. That's a burden. And that's basically saying because these people like follow food and go wherever they need to go to get food and uh, kind of like dawdle on their way there, material wealth is kind of uh, not useful because, you know, you really only have what you can carry and anything else is a burden. So even if it is like a compass or whatever, which you probably wouldn't be super useful, it's just kind of like, eh, God. Because, you know, the point is just that their way of life was extremely uh, subsistence based, but that also that... Prior to colonization and all these things, there was more than enough food to go around. And these people obviously knew how to prepare it. So they would really only spend like three, four, five hours a day, five at the max, like getting food. And if you were a hunter as opposed to a gatherer, um, maybe even you would just like hunt for a day and then not hunt for a week because you had everything. So that their lives were basically pretty much just concerned with subsistence and that was relatively easy to come by and that that kind of sets up his whole argument of like you know things were better <laughs> well, not better but like easier certainly <laughs> there's a quite a nice um first-hand account of these people's relationship to their belongings i suppose the quote says they do not know how to take care of their belongings no one dreams of putting them in order, folding them, drying them, cleaning them, hanging them up, or putting them in neat piles. Uh, if they are looking for something particular, some particular thing, they rummage carelessly through the hodgepodge of trifles in a little basket. Large <laughs> objects that are put up in heaps in the hut are dragged hither and yon with no regard for the damage that might be done to them. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool, honestly. I just, Yeah, I just like the idea of like quite how compelled we are to tidy up and keep a neat space yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. particularly in terms of like the relationship between i mean i i mean it it's it's it, this is going wildly off piste i suppose now <laughs> and it, it's it is true and it is the case that like um uh sort of like an ordered space might lead to like more productive existence and more productive work kind of thing mm. but like when those aren't your imperative they're just like plus, plus, plus as you say the sort of more material basis for this is that like they are nomads, right? Like mm. they have no need for a great many belongings. And in actual fact, a great many belongings just bogs them down. It's just harder yeah. to move around kind of thing. Yeah. And also that, that sort of stems also from the fact that all of the things that they can ever want, all of the sort of tools or things of any kind of utility are easily replaced or made or manufactured from everything lying around kind of thing. There is a huge amount of abundance that yeah. they're surrounded by based on what they have available to them i suppose yeah yeah and how great was the bit too about the tool maker too we talked about this a bit where it's like yeah it was one guy's job to make the axes and the arrows and the bows and he pretty much just spends his whole day just like napping and hanging out and eating and you <laughs> yeah. know doing whatever he wants <laughs> yeah what does he say his primary profession is mostly loafing around <laughs> yeah and everyone's just fine with that because it's like yeah okay we'll spend a couple hours a day going out and getting food and then come back and just hang out and you spend a couple hours a day making our stuff just relax, do your thing. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. And yeah, and the way that he talks about eating too, it's like, because there's so much uh, plenty, I, I really like this quote. He's quoting someone named Lejeune. I don't know who that is, but he quotes him as saying, eating among the savages is like drinking among the drunkards of Europe. Those dry and ever thirsty souls would willingly end their lives in a tub of malmsey. 
whatever that is, and the savages in a full pot of meat. Those over there talk only of drinking and those over here talk only of eating. So it's like very far from the like, you know, meager, like, oh, we can eat like, you know, the toe of one like monkey today. It's like these people are just cooking and eating and hanging out and okay, you the fish right up here. Let's go walk over there. And even when they walk over there, he describes it as very much just like a dawdling process and you have plenty. So it's just like, you know, just yeah, hang yeah, out. Yeah. There's a point where someone suggests that there are occasions when they will migrate purely for boredom with the food that's available <laughs> to them in a certain place kind of thing. It's not even that they eat a place bare and then move on kind of thing. It's like, yeah, mm. I've been fed up with this. This is all becoming a bit samey. There's not enough diversity in this. We want to have more diversity. Let's go and find that somewhere else kind of mm. thing. Mm. The general picture that is painted is one of plenty and diversity and an ease, yeah. I suppose. And one of the most refreshing things is this degree to which like, leisure and work are sort of enmeshed in a lot of ways like there mm. are various studies that he presents that are kind of like um they're quite they're quite uh they're, they're quite limited in time but the the but their records of um how much work is done ver mm. by various people on various days and it seems to vary wildly some days have a, a, some degree of work in but they're still only like maybe four or five hours mm. some of them it drops right down to basically nothing kind of thing so there's this variance from day to day in how much work is done and even w in, in some of the other sort of like research when they're describing what the work day is like it's very kind of leisurely they ostensibly go off like the women go off foraging or the men go off hunting but there's a lot of scope for like slacking off in that period kind of thing it's like we go off and we do a bit then we have a little lie down for a bit and we're, and like, we're going mm. to do a bit more kind of thing mm. it's just this like this relationship between work and leisure seems to be uh well there seems to be no distinction between the two almost kind of thing yeah. like one slips from one into the other with like a great de degree of ease i suppose because yeah i mean when there isn't a time clock you know what i mean and you're not like you're producing for literally just once and it's like damn i'm hungry mm. i'm probably gonna be hungry tonight all right you got some food i'm fine yeah, yeah, hang yeah. out oh, want some more go get some berries or something um I loved, I loved the bit where he said in like relationship to that, where he said just the sentence where he said, it's as if the superstructures of all of these societies has been eroded, leaving only the bare subsistence rock, which is basically just production itself for subsistence. That, that just like blew me away. Because, you know, again, with the like Neolithic revolution theory of everything, it's like, again, it's this contradiction between like people were eking out a meager existence but they had also lived like this for several hundred thousand years. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, wait, was just everybody before that too stupid to do agriculture? It's like, huh? <laughs> one of my first instincts when approaching this idea and one that's confirmed in the book is that like, if people weren't having their needs met with a degree of ease, then how, how basically how could a, a mode of production functioned and existed for, as you say, hundreds of thousands of years when everybody was on permanent on the brink of starvation, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, like, doesn't correlate in terms of like, how could this be a uh, consistent and successful mm. um, system? Yeah, and it just speaks to how stable it is too. And like, I guess we can talk, we should talk now about the actual Neolithic revolution because like he brings up, so the Hadza, was that who it was? Mm -hmm. The East, East, East African tribe of, who like were confronted with agriculture and people growing things and were like, look at these assholes. Yeah. These guys. This isn't even like Western. I think it's like other mm. groups of uh, na other native populations kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's, they, they basically make the point that it's like these guys are working harder than us to create the food that they need. And they're totally at the whim of like, this crop is destroyed, you know, I, I got blight or whatever, I'm screwed, <laughs> you know, now it's like, I guess I'll just die. Whereas he basically says that, like, to the hunter-gatherers, famine, unless there was, like, a huge ecological disaster, was, that was, like, inconceivable to these people, because they're mm -hmm. going to just get up and move, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, such that, like, one of the things that he's really sort of obsessed with giving an answer to particularly i suppose with the anthropologists at the time were very keen to give an answer to was just like why they had this attitude i can't remember the phrase he uses exactly but why they had this attitude toward food which was consume every every day is a feast you know like <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. no there's no there's no contingency left there's no preparation for mm. tomorrow kind of thing it comes in several forms kind of thing there's no effort made to like store anything but also like there's no, it doesn't even seem to be any effort to ration a limited amount when you have it kind of thing. Mm. It's just like, 
eat today under the presumption that there will be a feast again tomorrow. Kind of yeah, thing. and there will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, and the anthropologists seem baffled by this. And I think Solon's answer is basically just, yeah, exactly as you say. Like, under all likelihood, there will be. Yeah. Why prepare for anything else? Yeah. yeah. Some, if you think about it, I mean, like, something pretty massive would have to happen <laughs> in order for there not to be a feast the next day. You know, like... I don't know, like an asteroid or something like that. Like, presumably there's also like a flood or something like that or an earthquake or whatever. But like, still, those are the obvious exceptions to the norm. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like an apocalypse level event kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas the agriculture, the, the, the people living in an agricultural existence are paced with the possibility of like a minor apocalypse level event every season kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't have been if they were if they were no tilling, Dan. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> They're compost like. I mean, this really begs the question, right? Of like, how then did like agriculture get impressed upon people? Um, because if so many of these nomad groups were walking around being like, "Wow, you guys have lost it. Um, this seems like a much worse way to do things." Presumably, like, I don't know. It, it, he doesn't get into this too much, but it seems like it would almost just have to be a complete fluke, like. It's like maybe some group of people was like, all right, we'll plant some stuff. We figured this out. All right, now I guess we'll just keep doing this. And like they got hooked on it or something for some reason, mm -hmm. even though it seems like the illogical thing to do, which obviously that's why it took hundreds of thousands of years for people to actually start doing it regularly. Or they were forced to like some, like, I don't know if like, I was saying this before, but it's like somebody realized, hey, these people can all grow this type of food for me and I don't have to work. I'll force them to you know grow stuff basically like a slavery style thing but it's really like how can you convince people to go from absolute plenty to just like you know eventually under capitalism like enforce scarcity it's just, just like i wouldn't have wanted to do that like how did that happen yeah yeah i mean it's worth saying that this book doesn't really cover very fully that process or at least this this chapter of this book um i was really taken when with that quote from from some member of the Hadza who was saying like, mm. what, that looks far too much like hard work. Why would we <laughs> engage in agriculture? You know, that's so cool. um, and it made me think like m changes in mode of production of that sort are clearly motivated by necessity rather than opportunity kind mm. of thing. Now, now this is supposing that like, um, there is some obvious benefit kind of thing to agriculture over hunter gathering, which obviously this book is suggesting that there isn't. Or like at least like it's it's a kind of quid pro quo thing. One isn't mm. obviously more advantageous than the other. There's a really funny part when he sort of he he casts his um, uh, anthropological colleagues as being like <laughs> Neolithic revolutionaries yeah. in the sense that they're just obsessed with how brilliant the Neolithic revolution was. Mm. Um, like it was this great tipping point from which like uh, human civilization and culture um, and uh, humanity's basic ability to like provide for itself just sort of like exponentially increased you know mm. um and obviously he's painted the picture that that's not the case yeah um although it's fair to say that he does suggest that there are certain benefits and certain disadvantages to both modes of production i suppose i mean his basic description of um the hunter-gatherer mode of production is very simple and clear actually it's like there is great abundance, foraging and hunting, but it necessitates a degree of movement mm. because yeah. you sort of exhaust an area and then you move somewhere else or you have to move seasonally or what have you. Um, which then prohibits like, well, it, it it's what results in their general disdain for possessions because it's like, why would you mm. have things? Why would you have more than one thing? Yeah. One of a thing? Why would you like to want to accumulate more than one thing? Why would you like to, why would you need to store food? Because it's very abundant. And if you just store it, you just got to transport it somehow. So it, it leads to this very kind of like um, ascetic existence and the rejection of possessions. But also that results in a kind of like, it's not that they're like incapable of developing technology or great, more useful tools should they want to. It's like it's a needs and a, a, mm. a means and ends. The needs and ends thing, right? Like or means and ends rather. Like yeah, yeah. they have the means, but like it just wouldn't facilitate their ends. Mm. Um, whereas obviously there are certain advantages to an agricultural existence, which do then facilitate like 
a degree of division of labor which does result in a sort of degree of technical technological advancement should we say mm. but then it also sort of like allows for what we might just what you were just sort of describing what we might describe as like the early beginnings of class society mm. which he, he talks about sort of in terms of like this distinction between like social order versus economic order kind of thing like um the hunter gatherers has almost have almost solved the economic question. Mm. He calls him like uneconomic man at some point. Yeah, that's yeah, really yeah. That's that's as opposed to like the economic man or like yeah. Homo economicus kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's the reference to like yeah. like uh, like neoclassical economics, I suppose, mm-hmm. and its idea of like uh, human beings by their very nature being impelled by economic considerations, kind of thing. Mm. Whereas, uh, yeah, 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 the. Uh, the uh, the hunter gatherer was sort of the anti homo economicus kind of thing like he's mm. the uneconomic human being but yeah what he describes as like a degree of social order that's created by hunter gatherer no by agricultural society we might mm. describe as like class society kind of thing um, and it has certain benefits and it has certain detriments mm. I suppose I think Jack and I after reading this are now led to ask the question like whether the Neolithic revolution was a bad thing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, well, I mean, you you almost you almost talked about the one thing that made me go from being like, "Damn, I wish I was a hunter gatherer," to like, oh, "Okay, never mind." Uh, and it has to do with the, the mobility and the movement, right? Because it's like, okay, if you do constantly have to keep moving, someone's born with like a bum leg or like they're too old, it's like, yeah, kind of just have to leave them. Um, and it, you you know you wonder how that was actually treated in the society. Obviously, if you were, like, born with, like, some sort of deformity, you'd probably be like, I would prefer not to be left. Thank you. But it makes you think, like, if you were old, like, you'd probably be like, all right, I get it. I had to leave, you know, the old people back in my day as well. Mm -hmm. Probably still suck. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, this is far to say with everything that we're talking about that this was, like, a killer society because like there were great things and obviously you know with the lack of material wealth and like he says getting rid of the entire superstructure altogether basically and just relying on subsistence meant you had like infinite free time basically but also like eh, you know you had to like kill people who weren't right uh, you know well, inadvertently yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. indirectly i mean i guess mm. yeah so it brings up to me a question that lingers over this which i don't really have the answer to yet we were talking about a bit off mic like he uses the phrase culture quite a lot. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, and early on in the chapter, he criticizes um, other anthropologists for saying that, like, culture or the possibility of culture was almost denied these people by virtue of the circumstances in which they live, kind of thing. Like, they were working so hard to um, eke out their existence that they there was no possibility for developing culture. Mm. Um and he sort of, he, he, he criticizes anthropologists for saying that. Um, but he never really gives a very good definition of what he actually means by culture. So he does also suggest that the Neolithic revolution and the advent of agricultural society does facilitate a growth in human culture, I suppose. Which I suppose it obviously would if you have a division of labor, if you have more free time, if you have the opportunity for mm. like people, to, people to devote time to like actually pieces of art or... Mm cultural pursuits or philosophical pursuits but it might be quite a like um i don't know like a bourgeois or snobbish concept of what culture is kind of thing only certain things count as culture and certain things don't um you don't get a very good definition of what leisure time was like for these people other than eating and sleeping which they (laughs) seem to do quite a lot of there are so i mean there are some references to like game playing Mm. kind of thing and um but it's just not really very well developed. And what I was kind of hoping for was a full, sort of like a fully, a wholehearted commitment to these people presumably lived a, a cultured existence, I sure. suppose, of their own sort. Sure. Um, so, I mean, it's a short essay, but it feels like lacking in the sense of like, uh, as a, as a well, I suppose um, from the kind of like, Maybe this is a bit of a stretch, I suppose, or maybe I'm sort of like connecting things that don't necessarily need connecting very well. But like coming back to the kind of like the Mixes Wood critique of um, the commercialization model mm. and um, and the premise of Robert Brennan's 
discussions around the evolution of capitalism, which is to say that like you should see these things as distinctive modes in and of themselves kind of thing. It's not like one is deficient and is waiting to be like improved toward capitalism, you know, kind of thing. And in terms of like seeing the like hunter gatherer, the sort of primitive communist mode of production in its entirety, it would be interesting to sort of read it as a kind of like fully fledged mm. cultured societal existence as well. Um, yeah. Which you, well, yeah, just ask the question, I guess, of what, what culture is, because I mean, like, it makes it just seem like it's A, technology, and B, like, class society. Yeah. Because if you look at, like, actual concrete examples of, like, nomads or semi-nomads, like, intricate pieces of art, and intricate clothing, and games, games of chance, and, like, hobbies, like, you know, obviously, like, horse riding to the point of, like, you know, showing off and, like, actually having, like, big ceremonies and stuff. And even, like, trade. I mean, like, you talk about... Um, uh, in like some two match sites in Southern California, they've found like a specific type of like shell or something like that that can only come from like uh, where the Aztecs were. So they, they knew that there was like some kind of trade going on with the Aztecs all day in like Southern Mexico. So it's like the question of culture. It's like, you know, and obviously even like uh, creation myths and stories like that. So even like religion mm -hmm. or beliefs about the afterlife, it's like culture and a lot of anthropologists belief just seems to be class society and technology, just technological determinism and like bourgeois thinking, mm -hmm. you know? So like, I don't know. I mean, I'm a primitivist <laughs> after all. They would have to leave me. I say I would want to be a hunter gatherer, but they take one look at me and be like, oh, you're leaving you here. <laughs> yeah. Look after yourself. Um, what else? Well, I mean, I, I guess there's a couple of things. One of the things was I kind of wanted to pass comment and the discussion about um, <laughs> the society being Dionysian or not. Yeah. <laughs> but also, <laughs> maybe we'll do that now because it's kind of culture stuff kind of thing. Mm. Um, there's a reference on the very last page to a anthropologist who suggests that like um, the cultural orientation of these societies was it Dionysian or Apollonian, which I assume mm. means is a reference to the worship of Apollo kind of thing, mm. but gastric in the sense of like <laughs> they were committed to uh, uh, eating to excess kind of thing. <laughs> and then and then Solon turns it around and he's a bit like, um, but it, it turns it around and says that like, maybe it is Dionysian in the sense of it being Bacchanalian, presumably because mm. like the work and worship of Bacchanalia was... Mm associated with eating to excess in the way that like the worship of Dionysus was to drinking like Dionysus was like the the god of the wine god kind of thing yeah. as well as the god of like dance and festivals and and the like um and I bring it up because uh, there's a book that I really enjoyed reading a sort of anthropolo anthropology adjacent book Ooh. um called dancing in the streets it's the, mm. the subtitle is like a history of collective joy mm. um and it's like a it's sort of tracing basically the eradication of techniques of creating collective joy in populations from human society and culture as we've developed toward the present kind of thing mm. and one of the chapters is a discussion of like um but it's a, it feels quite speculative but also uh the author backs it up with a lot of reference to anthropology as well. There's this reference to that. There's a lot of discussion of like how central dance was to the existence of Paleolithic human beings, I suppose, in terms of like creating, um, well, holding communities together kind of thing, but the degree of like uh, joy that would have stemmed from that mm. and how it would have been how the she's speculating around the the enjoyment of dance the enjoyment of music the enjoyment of like masking and festivity and like uh rhythmic activity in the group in, in a sort of group setting kind of thing and how central that was to uh cultural life and collective life and uh le leisure time mm. in sort of paleolithic societies but also transitioning in through the neolithic revolution and then when we get into more sort of like concrete history discussion of like the cult of dionysus or like yeah the uh, mysteries the, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah or like all the transitions through rome into the sort of the mithras cults or like mm. worship of uh dionysus in rome or mm. like um and the various efforts to stamp it out for various reasons kind of thing and there is only one reference to dance in this discussion. It's talking about like <laughs> when um, 
when some hunter gatherers well hunters it's the men mm, who have yeah. like they, 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 they it's a description of how frequently they go off hunting and they're kind of like what they basically they go some days they don't go other days sometimes they have a success don't sometimes they don't have a success the reference the suggestion is that it's a hunting is a sort of like uh is something that has a connection to the sort of magical world like a hunt is either fulfilled or not predicated on things mm. that they can't basically can't understand so mm. um when they mm. have successive failures in hunt they quite often stay in camp for quite a long period of time and do a great deal of dancing mm. uh, and it was the only reference to dancing as a kind of like cultural and societal pursuit yeah um, and it didn't give much reference to like what the meaning or purpose was to that kind of thing yeah, it kind of just says the men dance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's interesting. I think because... they were like hyping themselves up. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, let's go. Um, it's interesting because he described at one point, and I only just under- kind of semi understood what he meant by hearing you say that. He describes like the act of hunting as somewhat magical because he basically just says, like, they don't know where the herds are going to be. They don't know why they showed up. They don't know why they're here now, why they're allowing themselves to be hunted, you know? Mm-hmm. And just describing that as magical is like how hunting and the life that they lived was like fairly just like, all right, leave it up to leave it up to everybody. It would be interesting. God, I'd love to know more about like the religion of these people, if you could call it that. But because it's, it's, it's so much more based on like not material, but like things that you're interacting with than just like, going to the building because you know like then like a post-neolithic style of revolution that was in in some societies <laughs> most uh uh built upon like domination and control yeah. whereas this was just like what you're interacting with we don't get it dude where does he go when he dies i don't know who prob- hopefully somewhere better let's bury him with a hat so he can have a hat when he's died i'd love to know some more about that because it's just like i don't know that just that just it reminded me so much of what you're saying about like the the like intense uh experience of like the dance and group dance of just like being this purely magical thing it's just like i don't know but it, it's all cool yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 i mean it's like a um it's uh i would imagine religion it was more of like a thing that objects inhabited inhabited mm. the world whatever the divine was whatever the sort of like spiritual belief was mm. and also like spiritual and religious practices also facilitated material ends kind of thing and if like if the religion was danced then the relationship between like the both the group solidarity and the sort of personal Mm. joy that came of a dance and that kind of like carnivalesque behavior gives religion another sort of material basis in like the meaning that existed or people get the meaning that people gave their lives kind of thing yeah and just stories it's just like you like communally creating a religion around stories and like somebody i don't know it's so cool how horrifying must have these people have seemed to like the guys who actually settled down and were like doing agriculture Mm -hmm. like you'd be you'd be horrified of like i can barely make ends meet spending 12 hours a day in my damn paddy field how are these people making they're just wandering around (laughs) that and also just like their concept of religion and of everything and like you, you i don't know you start to see like where the seeds of like this kind of like anthropological bias could have been formed while these societies were kind of like uh living side by side because it's like when like actual colonial powers came and like their minds were blown by people in like australia or people who were just living the good life like when cook showed up to hawaii it's just like this is paradise this is amazing and like equally like uh, on the other side of that like colonizers must have just seemed insane to these people it's like you know you always hear the like uh when the first aztec or whatever like saw uh, cortez's ships on the horizon they didn't they were like something's wrong with the horizon today they didn't know that these were like big ships they're just like something that was like whatever but it's like that you know that's a bit of like bourgeois thinking but like you totally get that these people are like this is how you live this is so tenuous this is insane like You know, and it's funny because you always hear accounts of, like, uh, famous, uh, like, American trappers or people, like, going into, uh, you know, like, the wild, quote-unquote, meeting these people and, like, giving these people, like, gifts. And then they immediately turn around and treat those gifts like shit because they're just like, this is how I treat everything. It's like, well, it comes and goes. I don't care. Thanks for the gift, I guess, but, like, whatever. Um, Just that dual ideology of, like wow, you're crazy. It's like, no, you're <laughs> crazy, man. Yeah, you, like... you, you gave another really good example before we started this discussion, started recording of like, um, 
colonizers in America, or, or rather the way the the sort of colonization and the genocide of the native populations of North America is presented as kind of like all right. these naive yeah. Native Americans didn't understand the idea of private property and like <laughs> the white the the, the white settlers came and exploited their naivety. And you could turn it around and just be like, no, the Native Americans recognized the white settlers as what they genuinely were, which is mad. <laughs> yeah, just to, like, crazy. To be so wildly committed to like yeah. personal and private property, particularly when you live in the existence of like collective communistic existence, yeah. sort of abundance you know <laughs> yeah well and it's and you you know you always hear the like mystical liberal like um they used every part of the buffalo and like <laughs> or like you know they called themselves after the land and it's like wow you're missing the point it's like they called themselves after where they live because that's your entire existence it's not a like these people had respect for the moon and the, it's like no it's yeah. just because yeah, yeah. you can't even fathom why these people did this yeah. it's because yeah. it just made sense yeah in this in this yeah in this book you don't get any sense of that kind of like <laughs> they used every part of the buffalo because it was which may may or may not have been may or may not be a good representation of how the mm. native americans considered mm. uh their um relationship to the buffalo kind of thing but in this book, you definitely get a sense of like the total abandon with which people <laughs> were willing to take from nature and not even use it, kind of thing. They will they, they mm. take more, and some of it will get wasted, kind of thing. Like we'll pick a load of food and we'll eat as much as we can, and the rest will go to the dogs, and it doesn't really matter because it yeah. was so much abundance, kind of thing. Mm. And you've just made me think now, like if that is a kind of like liberal-minded thing of like how in tune with nature they were kind of thing it is a very kind of like bourgeois conception of a relationship to nature because it's still mm. kind of recognizing things as like a limited resource yeah, kind of thing it's like finite and precious like, and yeah. like um where i was like such total abundance that you can't even like conceptualize it or think about it or reckon yeah. with it um i think that sort of transitions is one of the things we hadn't really discussed very much was like his very early sort of like sketching of a critique of capitalism kind of thing yeah. and a critique yeah, of yeah, like yeah. Uh, market societies and that kind of transitions into a, into that quite a lot a little bit because like one of his critiques of anthropologists is that like or econom econ economists as well as they've kind of like taken contemporary bourgeois citizen brain kind of thing <laughs> and this concept of like meeting infinite needs with finite means yeah. being the sort of like the economic formula Mm. Um, or failing to meet the yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or the struggle to meet your infinite ends with very limited means mm. is the kind of like economic formula of bourgeois society which they're the sort of bourgeois economists are trying to map onto all of human existence and solomon's is presenting it as like this is the root of the the sort of bourgeois anthropologists and the bourgeois economists mistake is to sort of like transpose um the sort of like the anxiety around scarcity that we experience in our contemporary existence as capitalist subjects subjects living under capitalism onto these people who had none of these material mm -hmm. concerns at all yeah well he makes the point right that human needs are extremely meager you know and they're most of this essay is describing how easy it is under normal circumstances to meet those mm. yeah there's a quote where he says um, so this is what the economists and the anthropologists have done. Having equipped the hunters with bourgeois impulses and paleolithic tools, we judge his situation hopeless in advance. Kind of that, that's such just, a kick-ass sentence. Yeah. That's so good. And so, yeah, I mean, we've talked about it already, but like, and we've talked about it in other podcasts, I suppose, in terms of like how an economic life lived in full subservience to the necessity to serve the market and to interact with the market in order to get what you need to exist mm. um, basically creates scarcity. Um, but the way he sketches it in this book, I think we were both really taken aback by in mm. terms of like the, the sort of basic formulation or calculation of a sort of market society is one in which you, every, what do you call it? Every, what is this phrase? Every, every market choice is a double tragedy kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, like, yeah you are both um you are forced to make an economic choice as what to do with your limited resources mm. but also by virtue of deciding what you're going to have you automatically cut off a huge number of other things that yeah you could have had instead kind of thing whereas in this sort of like primitive communist existence that rationale doesn't exist at all kind of thing mm. because you're just not applying uh 
like that but i mean i suppose he he presents their existence as a zen road to affluence yeah because it's just kind of like if you just limit your desires <laughs> you're king then you, <laughs> so you got everything yeah, you yeah. Need. which which i mean i suppose one could imagine being a piece of rhetoric for some kind of like abhorrent mindfulness yeah. kind of like a solution to the sort of crushing anxiety inducing experience <laughs> of living under market capitalism mm. like just don't want and then yeah. if you <laughs> just live if you out wanted of the for system. less then you yeah if you wanted for less then you would be content kind of thing yeah be content with what you have <laughs> which is not what we're not what we're advocating at all kind of yeah. thing we're advocating rather creating a system where mm. everything is already yours well that's why that's why you know that could very easily exactly what you're saying be used as like a lib kind of like ideological view of these primitives right these so-called primitives but like that's where it's studying this without the material basis for all of this will get you because it's like no if you actually look at like these people's material existence and when they came into contact with you know quote unquote like you know the settled like advanced people with the culture they were like damn i don't want that at all whenever you tried to give them things they'd be like i literally do not want this you know so like without that material basis of like oh they actually did have everything that they needed and they were able to be super happy and chill and you know uh, have plenty of time to not just relax, but also to like create like mm -hmm. art mm -hmm. and dance and like, you know. And it's not to say that it was great all the time. Sure. Not to say that it was necessarily like better or worse than any other society, but like it functioned internal to its sort of predicates and to the material basis mm. that it was built upon, I suppose, kind of thing. It's, a, it's an economic mode of, mode of production that functioned and had a full and rich life to it, I suppose. Mm. I think the phrase enforced scarcity that he uses is an extremely like useful phrase when talking about capitalism. Um, and all of this, I was kind of just trying to think of like, what can be kind of taken from these ideas that can be useful for socialism? Um, and when I was way too excited about this reading, I was like, socialism is just a mix of capitalism and the primitive mode. So I was like, all right, <laughs> calm down, Jack. Calm, calm down, Jack. <laughs> Um, but it is interesting, just like the general ideas of like meeting needs and like deciding what those needs are, but then also kind of like learning from the capitalist, like, um, understanding of this huge productive apparatus, because it's like, it's easy to see with this reading of anthropology and human history that like capitalism and even obviously like feudalism and even like the ancient mode and agriculture as all of that is organized agriculture like that is being a bit of an aberration because it's like, you kind of want to keep this like, uh, attitude of um everyone producing in a way that benefits everybody um but without the sim like simply like the class divisions that are have been created under our current aberration of a system and it is like i think just tie it back to when we were talking about like the hubble deep space photo it's like that's so like that just makes me think of like damn what an aberration this world is of like just random things coming together and you know like the typical like whoa man dude so crazy but it's also like when you think of capitalism like that and you're able to see that it hasn't just been this big slog to get where we are in markets, baby, we did it. Finally, this slog of millions of years of humanity to get markets. It's like you see that this could be a, viewed as a bit of an aberration, which is I think commies, we fully and truly believe that. And like you go, oh, you know, it's like when you first take the red pill and you realize like uh, – there are things called historical modes and it hasn't always been capitalism. Wait a minute. Then, then there could be something new and there could be something better. Um, and I think that's definitely what I learned because it's like, yeah, this makes it easy to be viewed, capitalism easy to be viewed as an aberration because it's like, ostensibly people could have been a lot happier before this goddamn Neolithic revolution. So, Yeah, in the same way that like the existence of human beings on Earth in relation to like the deep time of the universe or yeah. even the history of the planet is like, nothing like yeah. vanishingly uh. slim um capitalism in relation to the kind of like slightly less deep time of mm. human existence equally oh. vanishingly small a sliver of time mm. um and the sooner we overcome it yeah the better God, one of the one of the one of the sort of like propagandistic phrase pieces of phraseology that i like is the idea that human beings are still living in prehistory and only yeah. when we like overcome uh, class division will we enter our true sort of like maturity kind of thing and enter actual history i think after reading this i think we're living in our post prehistory <laughs> back in prehistory our pre 
post prehistory, back in prehistory. Now we got to get back to that post history. You know mm. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you can easy, you can easily see where the idea of human beings being fallen comes from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Probably yeah. pretty easy to pitch to like some sharecropper living in like you know early colonial america like oh yeah god where did we go wrong this sucks <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean the other thing that this makes me think about in terms of like the length of time that human beings lived in this way in relation to like how we exist now like obviously we're capable of existing now but like if you feel set upon by the pressures of this society mm. i mean it's totally reasonable if we have any kind of like quote-unquote natural way of existing and living mm. like it's uh, much more akin to this life of leisure where work and leisure are almost indistinguishable from one another, mm. where it's totally acceptable to sleep, take as many naps yeah. in the day as you want. There's a lot of sleeping. If you're sleepy, do. sleep. <laughs> Why not? And so um, on the back of this, I'm quite happy to present like human beings being abused on a very fundamental level by the pressures put upon them by capitalism. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And it really puts, I was frantically searching through the German ideology to try and find something about the primitive mode. Not much in there, tell you that, folks. But there is obviously the like famous quote of, you know, everybody's a pizza maker and a dog <laughs> catcher <laughs> and, a, and, a, yeah, and a philosopher without any being all of those things. It makes you like, that. this puts that quote totally in perspective because it's like if you were to go up to some of these quote unquote primitive people you probably couldn't be like oh you're a hunter they'd probably be like I'm just a guy <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. it's a similar thing with the possible exception of the guy that makes everybody's tools who loves around all day yeah he's the tool guy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right that, that guy rocked. and all the other schmucks yeah exactly everybody <laughs> keep he's him. the real king he knows what to... <laughs> yeah i'll make tools sure it's just like the easiest thing in the world it's a rock and a stick <laughs> Um, we should come back to this, I think, eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're, for the listener, a little peek behind the scenes, we're trying to get ahead of some episodes because Dan and I are both going away soon. Um, so not, probably won't be for a long time because we've got a lot of them planned out, but it's a lot of interesting stuff. Exchange value and the diplomacy of primitive trade. Mm. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it's worth pointing out that the way Solon's, um, presents these essays in the introduction is to say that this first chapter that we've read is kind of a description of production mm. under a primitive mode of production mm. and then the other ones are more about sort of like trade and exchange or consumption and that kind of thing mm. yeah no, that sounds fascinating there's an essay on the gift which i'd quite like to get the into gift. the spirit of the gift more gifts would be good tell you what gave someone a sack of potatoes homegrown potatoes yesterday felt really good mm -hmm. they're just i don't mm -hmm. know it's just like have some potatoes mm -hmm. partially because i'm trying to get rid of all my potatoes <laughs> but also ah, it feels good give a gift give more gifts yeah. especially i food. also like feel the opposite version of that which is like <laughs> I, I sometimes keep gifts that i'm given and i'm like hmm. <laughs> i'm now just lumbered with this thing <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. so i'm kind of with my sort of like primitive forebears when they're like i think normalize for? giving gifts of gifts if you're like this rocks, thank you so much. Re giving yeah. gifts, but it's like I know someone who would appreciate this more. That's yeah, a nice yeah, thing. Yeah. 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 Although if I see that person giving away my potatoes, I'm gonna freak out. <laughs> what if they let them go to rock? Oh, <laughs> man, whatever. <laughs> I, I would do the same. I can't eat like that many potatoes. Um everyone should read this, I think. It's very good. Yeah. yeah. Very good, very good. If not, just for like the two page description of capitalism as being one of the best ones, critiques, the best critiques you'll read, that's succinctly. Very good. Remember, enforce scarcity, people. Everybody, everybody, I think, understands that, knows what that means, mm. enforce scarcity. Um, so, yeah, good. Market's bad. Market's bad. Market's bad. When are we going to get over the whole market cult thing? So many people still think it's <laughs> like they just, I don't get it. It's just like this, people are just like, it works. It's like, yeah. here's it, X, Y, and Z. Here's why it doesn't work. Fails. It works. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what? You know it doesn't work. The only problem is all of these efforts to prop up the market are actually subversions of the market. Uh, well done, market. <laughs> Comrade market. Now I'm pro market. It worked. <laughs> uh, the church bells have started. Yeah, I don't know if they can hear Friday the church night, bells. Friday night. night. Friday night, church bell and podcasting night. Hmm. Yeah. It's good. It feels good to podcast on a Friday. We used to record oh, them on a Friday yeah. quite frequently. Yeah, what yeah. is it, the 30th today? 
Yes. So we're now a week ahead of when this is actually going mm. to air, which is what we used to do. We used to mm. be well in advance of when we were putting them out. And yeah. then we lost that at some point. But yeah. it feels quite nice to podcast on a Friday night and then be like, Oof, I know. Yeah. Done for the week. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, podcasting on a Friday. Is there anything better, folks? That's what I say. Right, go and have a beer. Go and have a bloody beer. Um, yeah, that rocked. Anything else? Uh, no, I think I think we're done. I think we're gonna yeah, end, end the podcast. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, thanks for listening. I've been done. I've been Jack. We'll uh, see you next time. The music you heard this episode was "Music to Kill Bad People Too" by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more comedy discussion. Till next time.